Perfect. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, The Impact of Human-Caused Ocean Noise Pollution on Fish, Invertebrates, and Ecosystem Services. Today's webinar is brought to you by Octo and the EBM Tools Network, co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. My name is Ray Evrard. I am project manager for Octo, and with me helping out today is my coworker, Sarah Carr of the EBM Tools Network, and we are very excited to introduce today's speaker. Before we get into the webinar, though, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of Zoom's features. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box and chat box. Please use these to ask any questions you may have for a presenter. You may ask questions at any time, but we will wait to answer them until the end of the presentation. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties or just have a general comment, please feel free to use the chat feature to let us know directly. And finally, if you want to watch or rewatch this webinar later, a recording will be available on the openchannels.org website, also on YouTube and Vimeo within the next 48 hours. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Today we have Lindy Weigart of Dalhousie University and Ocean Care. I'm very excited for this webinar, and thank you so much, Lindy, for joining us today. You're most welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll just uh, head right in. Um, so yes, I just want to say I am uh, Lindy Wildgard from uh, Ocean Care, supported a lot by Ocean Care. They are a small uh, environmental group in Switzerland, and they've really been leading the uh, ocean noise issue uh, in Europe, especially since about 2003. And I'm also an adjunct with the um, uh, Department of Biology in uh, Dalhousie University, Canada. So, Lindy, are you able to get a little closer to your microphone? Um, sure, I'll, I'll try a little bit. Okay. All right, <laughs> I'll try thanks. To up as well. Um, so, is this better? Uh, yes. Okay. So before we get any further in this topic, I think it's important to set the scene for how sound behaves in the ocean. And it's important to know that the speed of sound in seawater is almost five times that in air. And uh, for sound on land, it only really extends one to 10 kilometers, but underwater it can travel thousands of kilometers and again, very fast. So that changes um, a lot of, of aspects, in particular how and why marine animals use sound so much more than sight. And you know, they, they pretty much use sound like we would use sight, we're more visual. So in effect, marine animals see with their ears. And so to marine animals, flooding the ocean with noise is sort of like shining a flashlight into our eyes, blinding us. So we need to sort of switch our sensory modality to be more acoustic, to, to understand what ocean noise means to the ocean's inhabitants. So marine animals do rely on sound for pretty much all life functions. That includes food finding, reproducing, communicating, avoiding predators and hazards, and navigating and sensing their environment. Uh, so I recently completed a review and found that about 102 plus fish and invertebrate species have been documented to be impacted by noise. And this is about 66 species of fish and 36 species of invertebrates. And most importantly, the studies show on, on fish and invertebrates show that the impacts go beyond just impacts on individual species to include whole communities of species and how those interact with each other. And that can compromise the ecosystem productivity and ecological services. And by that I mean such as sediment mixing and nutrient cycling, which without which the ocean really cannot produce the life that it could uh, otherwise. Uh, 
And this will almost inevitably have commercial consequences and impacts on humans. So here are two sources of noise that um, are fairly common. Shipping is a big one, as well as seismic air gun surveys used to detect oil and gas deposits under the ocean floor, as well as some um, academic geophysical studies to look at plate tectonics and earthquakes also use seismic air gun surveys. So first I'll play the shipping noise, which is mainly the propeller cavitating as it turns. Uh, this is what it sounds like. Okay, and then this is a seismic air gun survey. You'll hear one very loud shot, and sort of the background is a little bit of a, a sonar, but it's, it's the one shot I need you to focus on. Okay, so and then bear in mind that recording of that air gun was made several kilometers away. So you can get a sense of the intensity of noise we're talking about here. And just to go into the uh, seismic air guns a little further, uh, can you guys see the cursor when I'm moving that? Is, does that show up? It does. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here um, on the seismic survey ship, you have the source of the sound, the seismic air guns, a rays of about 12 to 48, and they all shoot at the same time. They all go off at the same time. That sound can travel sometimes through thousands of meters of water. Then it further penetrates sometimes even 100 kilometers into the ocean floor. The echoes bounce back from various sediment layers and go into these underwater uh, microphones that are are towed behind the ship, sometimes on three kilometer long cables. They're called streamers. And that um, records the echo and that way they can figure out if there's oil and gas under the ocean floor. And these are, as you heard, very loud, intense broadband impulses or shots. And it's from air released under very high pressure. It's not an explosion, but pretty much acts like a chemical explosion. It's just very high pressure air. And the peak pressure is about 263 decibels, which is extremely high. And moreover, it's very intense because it has that sharp rise time, that very short going from zero to, to really loud very quickly, just like a gunshot. And this occurs every 10 to 12 seconds, these shots, and 24 hours a day pretty much, and often over months. So you can imagine what that must be like for marine inhabitants. And it's so powerful that if these were fired close to your arm, it would take it off at close range. This shows from the air what a seismic survey looks like. These would be the, the uh, air guns here and the uh, streamers that record um, and sense the sound, the hydrophones. And the, as a snapshot, the whole area this covers is about 26 square kilometers. And that is um, about half the size of Manhattan to get the island of Manhattan to give you an idea. These are, are huge areas and these boats cannot evade, you know, they, they don't have any maneuverability at all. And um, just to give you an idea of how far this sound travels, uh, this is a picture of the Atlantic here. This is Nova Scotia where I live and North America, South America, Africa, Spain. And in the middle is this uh, mountain range called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And here are these uh, hydrophones that are moored on the seafloor. 
and they a study of of uh, over a decade of monitoring showed that seismic surveys 4,000 kilometers away, this distance is 4,000 kilometers, <coughs> not only were heard, but were the main part of the background noise. So that just gives you a sense of the spatial range we're talking about. And this air gun noise was heard nearly constantly throughout the Atlantic from, you know, Brazil, other places other than Nova Scotia. <laughs> and off Nova Scotia, three surveys were heard at one time over the summer. And this shows during this time period all the places that seismic surveys were going on. The size of the star shows how many, but you can see how ubiquitous it is. It is a huge problem. To give you an idea of the loudness, uh, there are you can see up here explosions are um, 267 decibels, a volcano, an undersea earthquake also very high. And the seismic sur uh, survey array is, is right up there. It's, it's other than explosions, uh, chemical and nuclear explosions, it's the loudest human produced sound. Um, and bear in mind the decimal scale is logarithmic, so each increase in only three decibels is a doubling of intensity. So getting towards the impacts now, um, the uh, impacts can be on development in terms of body malformations, higher egg or immature mortality, there's developmental delays, there's delays in metamorphosing or settling, like from the larva, and slower growth rates. The anatomy impacts on anatomy include hearing loss, which can be up to months or even permanent, cellular damage to statocysts or neurons, the auditory nerve, and statocysts are the hearing or vibration sensors that invertebrates usually have instead of ears. And massive internal injuries can result as well as disorientation and death. For instance, this giant squid here, um, nine of them mass stranded from a seismic survey. Stress is a big one, one of the big impacts, and stress increases can be shown by increases in stress hormones, in metabolic rate, uh, in oxygen, greater oxygen uptake, greater cardiac output, more parasites, more irritation, more distress, and a higher mortality rate from disease and cannibalism, for instance. And uh, worse body condition, uh, lower growth, lower weight, uh, less food consumption, a worse immune response, lower reproductive rates, worse DNA integrity, and uh, overall physiology was worsened. Behavior showed avoidance of important habitat for, for days to years. And uh, Animals often respond to noise as they would to a predator. So like an alarm response, hiding and flight, increased aggression, decreased anti-predator defense, they're not as effective against predators, decreased nest digging and care, decreased courtship calls, spawning and egg clutches, decreased feeding, um, distraction, which means that their food handling uh, there were mistakes in food handling and inefficient feeding and uncoordinated schooling, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but can really have serious consequences. Masking is a big one. It's when the biological, biologically important sounds are obscured or obliterated. And uh, commercial catch rates have shown um, decreased landings, large fish leaving the area, increased bycatch, and decreased abundance. And then the important uh, ecological services showing uh, less water filtration with noise, less sediment layer mixing, 
and less bioirrigation, which is a key to nutrient cycling. The, if the nutrients aren't available, um, the ocean simply cannot produce as much life. And getting to a particular study uh, uh, recently, which showed that seismic air guns, actually this was just a single one, causing a hole in zooplankton out to 1.2 kilometers, which was the maximum range that was studied. So it could have been even further. And again, bearing in mind that seismic surveys usually consist of 18 to 48 air guns, and this was a single one. And the numbers were halved in most of the plankton species here. You can see the dead and, and the live ones. Uh, a third of the species were almost entirely wiped out. All of the krill larvae were killed. And overall, there were two to three times more dead zooplankton. And of course, zooplankton, along with phytoplankton that they feed on, are the whole base of the marine food web upon which all marine life depends. So you cannot have healthy populations of fish without viable planktonic productivity. So this was a real wake up call or should be and, and quite an alarming result. A pile driving, which I did not have a uh, uh, recording of, but pile driving is used for construction of, of ports and uh, of offshore wind farms. It's like a, a giant jackhammer, I guess, for, for ramming these structures into the ocean floor. And pile driving noise caused valve closure in mussels, which is a really energetically costly behavior. It disrupts breathing, heart rate, heart rate and excretion sort of like the, the muscles holding its breath. It halves oxygen concentrations and doubles carbon dioxide levels in just three hours. And the growth and body condition are likely to suffer with ecosystem and commercial consequences. Ship noise also suppressed uh, oyster activity and the volume of water flowing over their gills. That also decreased the food uptake. It slowed um, fat metabolism and growth rate and caused greater oxidative stress. And this slowdown in growth constitutes what the authors say as a potentially massive risk in terms of ecosystem productivity. Some more impacts on uh, ecosystem and ecosystem and e ecological services include uh, boat noise increasing larval mortality and developmental failure in sea hare embryos. This is this little guy over here. And sea hares, uh, humble as they are, they do keep corals and algae in check and, um, and, and in balance. And that's very critical. Otherwise, the corals get covered in in algae and they graze on toxic bacteria when you have these red tides and so on. So very important uh, little invertebrates. Uh, ship generator noise that's often used when ships are in port increases muscle biofouling here the, when the muscles are on the hull, attached to the hull, and it decreases their size with potential cascading ecological impacts, as the authors note. So bear in mind that vessel hull fouling is responsible for 75% of invasive species brought in by ships. So not only do you have these mussels that are costing the US Navy a, a billion a year because it decreases the efficiency of the hull moving through the water, too much turbulence and, and um, uh, friction, and so uh, the ship doesn't move as efficiently, uses more fuel, is noisier, but also attracts these invasive species that then get moved from port to port. So this is a problem with um, all sorts of overlapping problems. And noise also causes confusion and disrupts orientation behavior at a critical larval stage in reef fish. 
so the the larvae need to hear certain sounds to know uh, which would be the best reefs for them to orient to. And without this, it could affect uh, population welfare, it could weaken the connectivity between populations, which reduces the replenishment of fish species. <coughs> Noise also repressed burying and bioirrigation behavior or water circulation within lobster burrows in Norway lobsters. And Manila clams showed a stress response to noise. The individuals relocated less. They stayed on top of the seabed and they closed their valves. Again, like holding their breath, increasing their lactate dangerously. And that meant that clams could not mix those upper layers of uh, ocean sediment and they could not feed. So noise changed the fluid and particle transport that invertebrates provide which is key to nutrient cycling on the seabed. So here we're really getting at noise causing these more broad uh, ecosystem effects. Also, the, um, a seismic survey caused reef fish abundance to decline by 78% in the evening when the fish habitat use was highest. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a temperate coral reef one day before a seismic survey. This is the same reef during the seismic survey, but it was still, the survey was still eight kilometers away. And you can see the response occurred across all fish species. So this is a reaction of an entire community of species. And it means that the fish lose opportunities to aggregate, forage, and mate. For invertebrates in, in a tank study, a shrimp in louder tanks exhibited stress, decreased growth, decreased food consumption, lower reproductive rates, that's 50% um, versus 80% in the quiet tanks. Uh, the egg-bearing females went down to 70% from 92 in quiet tanks. The um, mortality increased from disease and cannibalism, and their metabolism was higher with higher oxygen consumption and ammonia excretion. And seismic area noise caused chronic impairment of immune competency and nutritional condition in lobsters. And interestingly, this occurred even four men months after the seismic survey ended. So these effects lingered on months after the noise was already gone. And developmental delays from uh, seismic surveys in scallop larvae occurred in tanks. 46% had body malformations. And this is getting back to that uh, study on scallops I mentioned. And here you can see cumulative percent mortality. These are the three years of the study. And these all show, this is uh, one, uh, sorry, no passes of the seismic uh, survey over the scallops. This is one pass, this is two passes, and this is four passes. So you can see, oh, this is starting days after the seismic survey. So it's increasing over those four months and is worse the more a seismic survey passes go over the scallops. And similar results in uh, 2014, um, only two points for 2015, but same, same general pattern. The more passes, the more mortality, and the mortality climbs cumulatively over time. Also, six hours of ship noise caused breaks in the DNA of the blue mussel, which and also resulted in lower filtration, which meant less algal clearance and oxidative stress. And again, the mussels are performing a very important ecological service of water filtration. That scallop mortality that I, I mentioned, also the reflexes, their reflexes were disrupted, they were immunocompromised, and their electrolytes were not in balance. And again, scallops improve water quality through biofiltration. 
they increase the light for underwater plants, they decrease eutrophication, there are too many nutrients in, in the water, and they feed uh, bottom-dwelling organisms by depositing organic matter from the water column. So very important ecosystem services here. Predator-prey interactions in fish changed with boat noise. Um, the food web dynamics, the whole community structure and stability were compromised. So it's really important having this broader view and, and getting away from just these species impacts because once you start with a few species and then change the interactions, the whole community is affected. It's a domino effect. Low frequency noise can cause substantial permanent cellular damage to the statuses and neurons in squid, cuttlefish, octopus, and even jellyfish that are made mainly of water. You wouldn't have thought uh, noise could even, you know, they're, they're pretty much transparent to, to a sound wave, you'd think, because it's just like going through water. But even there, the, the statuses and neurons were, were very damaged, and sometimes there was massive acoustic trauma, which was not compatible with life, and extensively damaged caged snapper fish ears in the field uh, from, from seismic noise. These were fish that couldn't escape in cages, but it was in the field. Seismic survey was um, run across them. You can see here, this is a healthy ear with the hair cells on the membrane, attached to the membrane. And after the seismic survey, it, they were torn off of that basilar membrane. And there was no recovery after 58 days. And uh, snapper ear is similar to many commercial species like um, tuna. Increased stress hormones were found and, and other stress indicators in all these species, bass, sea bream, cod, carp, perch, gudgeon, kelpfish, goldfish, shrimp, crabs, mussels, scallops, lobsters, and seahorses. And cortisol increased 81 to 120 percent in fish species with a shipping noise playback. So when they were broadcast shipping noise, the cortisol which is a stress hormone increased uh, quite drastically. Seabree moved more, showed less stress and intense metabolic activity with less energy for feeding, migration, reproduction in the presence of vessel noise. And they increased their oxygen uptake implying higher stress levels with pile driving noise. Tuna schooling, I mentioned earlier, they lost their aggregated structure and became uncoordinated and aggressive in the presence of vessel noise. And that can affect the homing accuracy for migration to spawning and feeding grounds. So if you can't find your, your spawning and feeding grounds, that's going to be a, a huge problem. The long-term abundance of blue whiting and other mesopelagic fish was higher outside the seismic shooting area than inside, and the fish dropped to deeper depths, showing they were avoiding the seismic shooting both vertically and horizontally. And fish in a marine protected area responded to boat noise as if to a predator attack. They decreased the nest carrying and feeding and ability to defend their, their territory. Uh, the noise, the boating noise caused masking and more calling, probably an attempt to overcome that masking, but who knows how successful that is and will have other costs likely associated with that. And this shows um, the reduction in catch and abundance of commercially important fish. Five days after seismic survey, the trawl catch rate reduced by 69% to longline catch rate down 45%, longline haddock catch down 67%. There was a drop of 52% in catch per unit effort for the rockfish hook and line fishery, and an overall 50% average economic loss. So here is a, a histogram of abundance. This shows the dark is before, the, gray, the striped is during the seismic survey, and um, 
This is after, before, during, after for cod and haddock. So you can so you can see that uh, compared to before, during, and after is noticeably less um, fish are less abundant. This shows um, the catch versus how far away in nautical miles from the seismic survey. So here the catches were lowest closer to the seismic survey again before, during, and after. Before is a lot higher. Um, moving away, it's a little bit higher catches, but not compared to before. The top is cod and the bottom is haddock. It's also similar pattern there. And this is the um, daily catch of landed uh, sand eel. This is before the, the seismic shooting period of only three days here. And you can see after quite a few less, quite a bit less uh, landings. And this sort of uh, depicts what I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a, a very small seismic shooting area of only five and a half by 18 and a half kilometers or 5,500 square kilometers. This shows the density of the fish, um, sort of the, the abundance. And um, so red is, is most abundant and blue is fewest fish. And before, a lot of fish. And during, you can see quite a drop. The trawl catches of cod and haddock and long line of haddock are reduced by 70%. And then after, still very low abundance and the uh, fish abundance and catch rates did not return to the pre-seismic level even five days after the shooting ended and I don't think they looked beyond those five days. So in summary you have most marine animals are very dependent on sound. And this is because of the unique properties of sound in, in water, the speed and how far it travels. 102 plus fish and invertebrate species have been shown to be impacted. The impacts include uh, decreased growth, a lower body condition, uh, less feeding, less reproduction, lower abundance, worse immune competency, worse nutritional condition, lower catch rates, uh, worse school coordination and structure, worse nest carrying and territory defense. The noise can cause permanently damaged ears and sensory organs, developmental delays and malformations, increased stress, metabolism, more masking or obliterating of biologically important sounds and outright mortality. And these impacts extend beyond individual species to include communities of species and how they interact, compromising ecosystem productivity and ecological services, such as sediment mi mixing and nutrient cycling with commercial consequences. Thanks very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Lindy. That was really, like interesting to uh, listen to and I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, we have quite a few questions already lined up and I urge all our attendees to send in the questions to the Q&A or chat box and I would like to state again that this presentation will be available on open channels. Uh, recording of the presentation will be. It will also be on YouTube and Vimeo and we probably will have a PDF version of it, maybe without any pictures though, available for you all afterwards as well. So time for some questions. Um, oh, can I just interrupt yes, to say of that, course. Um, that this re the report that this is based on is available online if you just look under ocean care and um, impact of ocean noise pollution on fish and invertebrates. You ought to be able to find it online. I'll post the link in, in just a second for everyone. Perfect. All right, thank you all so much. Um, so here we go. Are, are the US Navy's sonar pulses as noisy as seismic surveys? 
and what are the impacts? Sorry, the sonar. The U.S. Navy's sonar pulses, as noisy as seismic surveys. Uh, they're probably it's it's classified, so we don't know exactly how loud they are, but they they're probably that they are awfully loud. I'm not sure if they're quite as loud. Um, they are a different type of sound, so it's um, like a sweep and um, not not a not a shot. So at least you don't have that um, short rise time issue. I was saying that that's very uh, dangerous to living tissue when you get that. Um, fast difference from from that fast change zero to, to really loud really fast that's that, that tends to tear living tissue and and is particularly dangerous but they that sound appears to uh, really mess a lot of whales up particularly it's not shown to be yet to be um damaging to fish or invertebrates it hasn't been really looked at it's been looked at a little bit with fish but certainly to whales and a particular family of whales it really um does a number on them they can die within four hours from hemorrhaging from their brain and vital organs and um so that that's probably more of a um a panic response maybe the the whales uh, change their dive pattern and maybe causes decompression sickness so each sound source has its own problems and so whether like i don't want to even compare which is worse they're all bad um <laughs> and they're bad to particular species in particular ways okay perfect thank you um can you please speak uh, to the issue, noise issues associated with offshore wind turbines. Are there methods that could be used to help mitigate noise impacts for turbines or any other sources that are being imposed on marine systems? Yeah, well, with turbines, you've got the, the operational noise and the construction noise. So um, the um, Construction noise is almost certainly worse. It's more intense. But the nice thing is that I would say the, the pile driving industry has done far, far more, have been far more open maybe because they're newer or they're, you know, meant to be green. Um, they've, they've been vastly more successful at mitigating their sound. So um, there are so many, and I, I just was at a, a conference in Germany in November showing yet another whole new technological innovations for, for even making zero noise emissions. So that the, these piles, these, these big, um, you know, foundations or, or the, 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 the poles themselves, um, these huge cylinders, that they just basically can slip into certain substrates without any noise. So I think a huge amount of development is happening there and a lot of progress, a lot of innovation. And this is partially spurred by Germany and, and maybe Netherlands and Belgium as well, uh, really requiring them, you know, legally requiring them to not exceed certain noise levels. And the moment you have a, a um, target like that or, or a limit, a noise limit, then lo and behold, the companies will, will comply and will figure it out. The engineering solutions are plentiful. And it's, it's extremely encouraging to see how, uh, how much noise reduction can happen that way. You also have to be concerned about the sound going through the substrate. It can go through the water, but it can go also go from the water into the substrate, the, the, the floor, and then come back out further on. So you, you, know, you have to be cognizant of, of all the ways, the pathways that noise can get out. But I would say that is looking very promising. As long as governments hold these um, piling industries accountable to, to lowering the noise levels, it can be achieved. Okay, 
Oh, and as far as the operational sound, I it's still a little like it could, could be very low frequency, and it's to me it's it's not clear yet whether that's gonna gonna be a problem or not. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're getting a couple questions associated with salmon. Um, do you know if any impact of ship noise on Chinook salmon or just salmon in general, or any studies about noise affecting salmon? Uh, the salmon are fairly deaf from a pressure point of view, but you also have to be concerned about particle motion, which is like the particles like moving through the water rather than a pressure wave. And uh, so fish tend to hear both through both types. And um, so it's unclear, you know, how how they respond. Like there, the whole particle motion side of things is is in its infancy. That's uh, sort of hard to measure sometimes and tricky. And so we're just getting a little bit of a handle on that. And um, uh, so I would say that is fairly unclear. I would consider it probably more of a short range effect if they are sensitive to particle motion. It may only be at the low frequencies and close by, but again, not, not totally sure. Okay, no worries. Thank you so much. Um, for getting, we were asked if you could show the slide that contained info on boat noise on oysters again. Um, is that possible to go back to that slide? Let's see. Can I do that? Let's see. Oops. Uh -oh. Uh oh. No worries if not. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, oysters. There. That one? Perfect. I believe so. And um, we have a question associated with that. Um, what distance would ship noise um, impact oysters? That shellfish. And I guess someone just wanted to see the slide. Um, oh dear. Um, <laughs> that one. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm afraid I do not have the uh, the distance of, of that offhand. I. Um, the wild art reference. Leave a message. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I was just calling to confirm your appointment for tomorrow, Wednesday, May 1st, at 9 o'clock a.m. is a 55-minute appointment with our nutrition. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to look. I'm trying to look this up, that particular study, but I don't think I have any more offhand on that. You'd have to look at the original report and the and the literature. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so is the whale stranding on, can we associate whale stranding on beaches with um, noise impacts? Some of them, yes. Yeah. Some of them are acoustically induced strandings. And the way you can tell which ones, certainly not all of them are, but some of them are. And the, the way that you can generally Tell if it's an acoustically induced stranding is if there is a lot of um, is, is if the individuals are spread out like over kilometers of a beach and they all strand at the same time because sound is the only thing that can travel that fast that far. So if you have um, a lot of animals that at pretty much the same time end up over fairly large expanses of, of beach that is a tendency to suspect acoustic uh, stranding. You won't always find in the necropsies or the autopsies, you won't always find the damage there because they may not have um, physiological or, or anatomical damage because again, it could be a panic response. So they, the panic could cause them to strand rather than uh, uh, having an injury first. In the case of uh, sonar and particular family of whales called the beaked whales, they, they do 
show um, this hemorrhaging, this bleeding in, in their brain and vital organs, uh, even if they don't strand. So they can, they, you can see carcasses at sea that have this damage. So the beach isn't always necessary to kill them, but sometimes uh, it's, it's only the beach that kills them, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, what can citizens do to help combat these issues? Yeah, well, you know, to the, the main, the big three are naval sonar, shipping, and seismic surveys. And, you know, those of us concerned with these issues, you know, thought about it and thought, well, if we had world peace, we don't need this. One <laughs> <laughs> if if we got away from our oil dependency, we wouldn't have seismic. And uh, if we didn't consume so many goods from far away, consume so many and from far away, we wouldn't have as much of a shipping problem. So <laughs> yes. uh, pretty much all things that, that help um, the world in general are also good for reducing noise. Um, you know, to me, I think reducing our consumption, reducing our oil and gas consumption and consumption of goods is always good, buying local. Um, I think all of those are, are important. And, um, you know, just, I guess, pressuring governments to, to take noise seriously and to require um, quieter alternatives. A lot of these are well within our technological abilities. You know, the engineering solutions are out there. You can replace uh, seismic air guns with quieter alternatives the same way we did on land. And um, there's just no will. And if, if the regulators, you know, the various agencies, government agencies and bureaus don't require it, it won't be done. Okay. Perfect. That's very true. Um, is there any way to mitigate shipping propellant noise? Any new technologies available that you know of? Well, the big thing with shipping is if for most types of ships, for the, um, the constant pitch propellers, um, if you slow down, you will be quieter there's a, a cavitation inception speed above which cavitation that that loud shh, you know popping of of uh, air bubbles that causes the sound the cavitation sound in propellers if you stay below that speed you will be vastly quieter so if you can just slow down to maybe 10 to 12 knots instead of 18 or so it can make a huge difference and not only will it make a difference in the noise it will cut your fuel costs tremendously and you will less likely strike a whale and kill a whale so there are lots of benefits to slowing down and uh, where the international maritime organization has committed to reducing carbon emissions from shipping by 50% by the year 2020, this is what we're trying to piggyback onto because if they slow down as a way to uh, reduce their emissions, they will also be a lot quieter. Okay. That's, that's the easiest one. There are also technological alternatives that can be done to improve the uh, wake flow into the propeller to match the the hull and propeller better so that you have a uniform wake field so that there's less turbulence and so on you know there are all sorts of things that can be done but um, that would require it to be done on new ships and and new ships have a lifespan of about 20 years and that means you have this lag time of 20 years so you know stuff that can be done now on almost all ships is the slowing down okay perfect thank you um does canada have underwater noise guidelines or limits for marine construction activities dredging blasting pile driving etc not to my knowledge <laughs> okay, nice and easy. Well, yeah. hopefully. I mean, 
the, 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 you know, Transport Canada and the Ports of Vancouver and Prince Rupert are, are leaders in um, testing mainly from the southern resident killer whale population problems there. Um, they are really trying to study what causes the loud ships to be loud and the quiet ships to be quiet and to uh, incentivize the quieter ships in, in reducing the port fees. Those are all brilliant ways to to move in the right direction and I, I'm very proud of Canada for that. Um, but yeah, they can do <laughs> more on, on, on seismic surveys. They're not great. Okay, good to know. All right, um, based on your review, do you think the experimental intensities and sound exposure levels are generally close to what animals typically experience in the wild, or are they too high or too low? Um, afterwards, he says, in a few studies, I read that fish and invertebrate response to ship noise, his impression is that the laboratory received levels that are a lot higher than what might occur for wild animals, even in the urban estuaries. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, there is something to be said for what an animal typically experiences in terms of natural noise levels in their natural, you know, there's always gonna be storms and lightning strikes and earthquakes, that, that's not typical usually. So I do think you could use that as a benchmark of what um, a particular marine animal might be used to. And certainly the fact that a lot of the Arctic mammals seem particularly sensitive to noise uh, indicates to me that they are used to a pretty quiet environment under the ice. Um, so, sorry, the question again was... Um, Based on your review, do you think the experimental intensities and sound exposure levels are generally close to what animals typically experience in the wild? Yeah, I think the... I think they're too high. I mean, I, I, from what I have seen, you know, I'm, I'm, I always think it is, is not just a, a, an important value, but also scientifically fully defensible looking at our history that we should be more precautionary. And I, you know, you can look through hundreds of cases of where we saw all the signs in the science and ignored them mainly because of corporate interest and lobbying. And there's maybe two or three of where we might have been too careful. So I am, I think it's completely scientifically justified to be precautionary, not to mention a lot cheaper generally <laughs> to, to uh, err on the side of caution. So I do not think any of the, the noise levels I've seen, I do not think are precautionary enough and they do not consider interactions of uh, various stressors. Like most of the stressors in nature do not occur alone. You're not gonna have just noise. You're gonna have uh, overfishing. You're gonna have uh, bycatch. You're gonna have um, ocean acidification, climate change, all of these, the animals are having to deal with all at once. And so looking just piecemeal at one stressor is not, is not at all precautionary. So I don't think any of these levels that I've seen take that into account. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Port of Vancouver will be visited by 290 cruise ships this summer, between now and November 1st. The peak Alaska cruising season occurring during critical feeding periods for orcas in the Salish Sea, straight, to, straight of Georgia. Are there any recent studies that you know of that look at the impact of cruise ship industry on ocean noise levels in those waters? Uh, sorry, that look at the um, of cruise ship activity. Yes. Um, uh, let's see, there's the only study I'm aware of is like cruise ship up in Alaska and the impact on, on humpbacks. But, you know, overall, like this person is talking about like a whole host of cruise ships, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, you know, that these are the sorts of studies we need is, is, you know, not piecemeal. Look at, you know, an actual realistic scenario. What is one um, geographical area exposed to? 
and uh, I don't think we, we do near enough of that. Uh, in Europe, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is, is, is moving in that direction, trying to look at a regional sea approach and how much noise is, is being added there in a regional sea. And I, I think we need to do far more of those sorts of studies and, and take action not, and not have the action waiting on the studies because we know now that, I mean, I, I think, you know, a hundred studies showing impacts on a hundred different species should be enough to take action. Okay, I agree with you. Um, has there, has any work been done investigating how underwater noise has changed over time? I assume there is more now than there used to be, but is there any work on overall noise trends and also different types of underwater noise? Yes, there are a few areas like off California where you do have like a 40 year picture of what background noise levels were. And they do show a doubling every decade for the last four decades, I believe. So, you know, and where, if that's it, most likely the North Hemisphere is louder than the Southern. Um, but you can also project how many ships, how, how shipping uh, traffic is going to increase. And that is dramatic. So um, one hopes that the newer ships might be quieter, but when there's no requirement for that, that could just be lucky. Um, Maersk, the big shipping company, did retrofit several of its ships at huge expense to make them more um, energy efficient and fewer emissions and found that at the same time they became quieter, just even though that wasn't the, the purpose. So that was a, an ancillary benefit. So one hopes that the newer ships might be quieter, but uh, there will be a lot more of them. Mm -hmm. So and there's really so far no correlation with age of ship and how much sound noise they produce. So likely it's going to get worse. Okay. Yay. Um, can you explain, <laughs> this might be our last or second to last question. Um, can you explain how the seismic surveys and associated impacts used for mapping offshore sediment sources, such as for beach replenishment, replenishment efforts, differ from seismic used for mapping offshore oil and gas reserves? Oh boy, I'm not sure I know about the first <laughs> one. Oh, no worries. Sediment? Uh, that, that's, that's a marine seismic survey looking at Sediment. Let me just look at that again. I found that question. Um, from that, oh, sediment sources. No, I'm sorry. That is beyond me. I have not. I have not heard about sediment sources. Well, I mean, they that wouldn't have to penetrate. I would have thought if they're just trying to replenish beaches, I can't see how they would need to penetrate deep. So then it wouldn't be very low frequency. I wouldn't have thought it would be that loud either. Okay. That's just all I can say on that one. <laughs> no <I'm>, worries. <laughs> I can, add, can I answer some of these questions? Like, Absolutely, them? please. Yeah, yeah, because some of these I can just answer outright by typing in. Um, yeah, and all these questions will be given to you at the end of this presentation. So any ones that you feel like answering back, uh, the emails will be associated and uh, you may answer them then as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are towards the end of the hour. And so I would just like to say thank you and thank you for everyone to send in your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. There were a lot of questions being sent in and they're all very good. Um, so. Yes, Lindy will have them all and um, hopefully you get some answers back. And if not, this webinar will be available on, on the Open Channels website and uh, a PowerPoint should be available as well. So thank you all for being here today and thank you so much, Lindy, for presenting. No problem. Thanks for your interest, everyone. Yeah. All right, everyone. Bye. Bye.